Okay, so um, thank you everyone for coming to this talk, which is uh, on the evening of March 26th, if you're in North America, or the morning of March 27th, if you're in Hong Kong. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative project, the Lower Seisan Two Dam in Northeastern Cambodia, and sacred space in Northeastern Cambodia, particularly in relation to uh, spirit mediums and their interactions with that dam and some of their explanations about why things have gone the way they have. So I'll just get right to it. Um, oh, I should say that uh, this paper has actually been written in collaboration with a, a PhD student of mine, Ekala Sukapon, who uh, is not uh, here today, but uh, was very involved in both the field research and writing of this paper. Okay. So this is the Lower Seisan Two Dam, which is one of the most controversial hydropower projects developed in mainland Southeast Asia in the last few decades. And it uh, is built just below the confluence of the Shreipok River and the Seisan River uh, in uh, Seisan District, Stung Drang Province in Northeastern Cambodia. Um, just to give you a little map so you can see where it is in relation to the mainstream Mekong, which is coming down in the center of the map. And then you see the Saigong River, which uh, comes into the Mekong and goes up into Laos. And then you have the Seisan River, which is the middle river uh, moving from the east to the west, and then the Shreipok River. And you can see where the lower Seisan uh, two dam is on the confluence and therefore floods part of both the Shreipok and the Seisan River in uh, Stung Treng province. And it's a pretty large dam. It's about 400 megawatt capacity, which is presently the largest dam in Cambodia. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's it's uh, located in Stung Treng province. So um, just to give you a sense of who the investors are and how the uh, the political economy of this project. It's uh, the main investor is Hydro Lansang International Energy, which owns 51% of the project. Um, the other major investor is a Cambodian investor, the Royal Group, which has 39%. And then Electricity to Vietnam, uh, the Vietnamese government's uh, electricity provider owns 10% of the project. And that's mainly for the initial work that they did because Initially, they planned to develop this project themselves, and they did the uh, the feasibility studies for the project and some of the early uh, studies that were related to this project. And so they've maintained a 10% share in the project in lieu of those uh, that the work that they did earlier. But in fact, they're not really involved in the uh, they they weren't really involved in the every in, in the actual construction of the project or the operation of it. Um, so most of the financing for this project that came through Hydro Lansang International Energy um, was from the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so this is one of the largest Belt and Road Initiative projects that has been invested in in Cambodia by the Chinese. And so it's it's kind of uh, uh, a major uh, project to see how uh, how Chinese investment is working in, in Cambodia. Um, there has been uh, a lot of resistance to the Lower Seisan Two Dam since its conception, um, even from the time when the Vietnamese were planning to build it, and then later uh, since the Chinese got involved. And uh, there were a lot of local, a lot of local opposition to this project from the very beginning, from back in the 2000s, and then uh, also more recently. Uh, and, and even up to now, there are still villages that have refused refused to resettle as part of the resettlement program and uh, are still uh, you know, opposed to the project up to now. Um, the One of the reasons that many people are opposed to the project is that it, it is uh, having major environmental and social impacts, both uh, what, upstream from the project, so in terms of areas above the reservoir, also within the reservoir area, obviously, and downstream from the dam as well, uh, down to the Mekong River. Um, and uh, the, this is particularly because uh, this river system is a very important place for migratory fish that migrate from other parts of Cambodia 
and from Laos and Vietnam and Thailand. Uh, they, they go up the 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 Seisan River at the Seigong and the Shreibok rivers um, to uh, to uh, at certain times of the year to spawn. And uh, now that the Lower Seisan II is being built, it's blocking two of the three major rivers within this system. Now, the, the 3S system, as is typically known, uh, the Seigong, Seisan, and Shreipo, makes up about 20% of the Mekong River's water. So it's the largest uh, tributary system of the Mekong, so a very important river system. And a lot of migratory fish moving in and out of this river system. And so this dam has had a very significant impact on those migrations. So that's even that's why it's even affecting villages well above the reservoir because fish that used to migrate up to those villages are no longer getting there because of the blocking of the river by the dam. Just as a, to illustrate what we're talking about, so this is the Lower Say Santu Dam, which is now completed, and you can see there's a, a fisherman just below the dam catching some fish. And uh, what's actually happened is, is that this is actually a very good place to catch fish because a lot of fish that have been trying to mig migrate up the river have been blocked by the dam and uh, are therefore, you know, um, swimming just below the dam and uh, actually makes for very good fishing. Of course, in the long term, the prospects aren't good because if the fish can't migrate up and they can't spawn, then they won't be coming down again and their life cycle is being broken. And this is having a very significant impact both from a biodiversity perspective and also from a livelihoods perspective for the large number of people that are dependent on wild capture fisheries you know, in, in the Mekong River system, both in the 3S system and, and farther beyond the Mekong because fish are migrating from all over the Mekong region coming up this river at certain times of the year. Okay, I won't. Uh, oh, and this and this fish is actually this is one of the most ironic things is that this this is a, actually a statue in Stungdrang Town that was built for this uh, species of fish. It's uh, called Basai in in the local language, and this is a considered a delicacy in Cambodia. It's one of the most important food fish uh, in the region, and ironically, uh, it's one of the fish that that has been most impacted by this dam and uh, uh, catches have declined significantly because the fish cannot get up and down uh, the river because of the dam. So uh, they, they they have this big monument in Stuck Trang Town for a fish that is now uh, in heavy decline because uh, of this dam. Okay, so I wanna, let me tell you the argument that I'm trying to make or the point that I wanna make in this presentation. So basically this paper, is looking at the relationship between the Lower Seisan II Dam and sacred spaces of rural ethnic Lao people. So even though this is in Cambodia, I'm mainly talking about ethnic Lao people who live in Cambodia, who've lived there for generations. These are not new migrants. They've been living there, you know, for hundreds of years. Um, and uh, so they're not like migrants from Lao, but they are ethnically Lao and they speak Lao primarily. And this includes looking at their traditions related to spirit mediums and related beliefs uh, and how this has been impacted by these, these beliefs have been impacted by the Lower Seisan II Dam. Now, in the paper, we take a, a feminist political ecology approach to this studies because primarily the spirit mediums that I'll be talking about are women. Um, and they have uh, contested the Lower Seisan II since it uh, was first envisioned and people knew about it up until the time it was being constructed and, and even up to now. And so they've been heavily involved in the community struggles against this project. And basically, we argue that uh, apart from having potentially important material impacts, I mean, the dam is negatively impacting on the fisheries and people's livelihoods, but it's also have serving to alter the nature society relations that exist within communities through variously affecting the spirit mediums, their places and their practices. And I'll get into that a little bit more as we continue through the uh, presentation. So let me tell you a little bit about spirit mediums or the Lao spirit mediums uh, of Northeastern Cambodia, um, of one of whom is in this photograph. Um, so spirit mediums are in Northeastern Cambodia are typically older women, about, you know, uh, I would say 97, 98% of them are, are women. 
um, who have uh, who are believed to have been chosen by a particular spirit or spirits to uh, uh, of, of past, usually past community leaders, but potentially other people as well, um, to be basically the vectors of these spirit mediums. So the they the the spirit mediums will communicate with the community or villagers through the spirit medium. So the spirit medium is not shamanistic in the sense that they're not out looking for things. They're simply a vehicle for the spirits to pass through. So they're possessed by them. And when a spirit uh, possesses a, a spirit medium, it's believed that that person has no control over what they're saying, that it's just the spirit speaking and not the, 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 the spirit medium themselves. So uh, the spirit mediums are never blamed for anything that's said when they're believed to be possessed by a spirit, okay? Um, and uh, they, uh, the spirit mediums I'm talking about today are not professional spirit mediums. They're not ones who typically get paid for the work that they do. They do most of what they do as a kind of community service. So they're village level spirit meetings rather than more professional spirit mediums that you find in cities. These are rural spirit mediums that I'm talking about. Um, usually there's one per village in most cases, or sometimes if a village is, is, a, is a, uh, a village that's brought two smaller villages together, there may be two spirit mediums, one for each part of the village, depending on the situation. So, for example, this is one spirit medium in northeastern Cambodia, and uh, there's the the what they call the the ha or the spirit house where the rituals that relate to the spirit medium occur, which is usually located in a a small forest area near the village, as is the case here. And uh, typically, inside the spirit house, you won't have you know Buddhist images or other. Uh, uh, Buddhist related artifacts, even though all the people in these villages would claim that they are Buddhist, but you would, is, instead you have uh, sacred rocks. Uh, these are uh, weapons uh, like guns or spears. And uh, that's what you, you and, and you have these sacred rocks as well in the in the uh, spirit house. And uh, so nothing of any value. They don't lock it up or anything like that. There's nothing really to be to be stolen here or anything like that. This is another spirit medium in another village in northeastern Cambodia. Just to get, get give you a sense of what these women look like and the ages that they typically are. So this is a little this this woman is a little bit younger than some other spirit mediums. And here is a different spirit medium in another village. And here is another one, and her daughter in in another village and it's likely that in this case the mother will be the spirit medium and probably when she passes away her daughter will probably probably become the spirit medium after her although that's not being proclaimed yet at this point but often uh spirit mediumship is passed down by the female line mat matrilinearly um, although not always and uh uh there are occasionally men who also serve as spirit mediums but very occasionally. Okay, so in the Lao community in Northeastern Cambodia, uh, spirit mediums are particularly, particularly uh, um, active in a couple times of the year. They, they go to these uh, small spirit houses or the ha as they're known, and uh, they do rituals uh, in the third and sixth lunar months, which coincide with, you know, between uh, February and May. Um, and uh, also sometimes during the Buddhist New Year in April, which is which is the fifth lunar month. Um, and there they 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 act totally independently from uh, Buddhist monks. They, they they will not attend any rituals uh, that Buddhist monks attend, at least as when they're possessed with spirits. And uh, Buddhist monks will not attend any of their events when they're held. So there is a, a strict uh, division between the two. Although, uh, in fact, most people in villages will attend both the Buddhist temple and spirit medium practices as well. And there are particular uh, sacred spaces associated with these spirit mediums. And the one I'm going to talk about today is the Tada Rapids, which is on the Seisan River. 
And you could probably say that the practices that these people have are what you might consider to be pre-Buddhist or at least uh, uh, not coming out of Buddhism in the sense that uh, uh, they're, even though they're both, they're influenced heavily by Buddhism at, at times, but the core of what they're doing is, is not related to Buddhism, this, the spirit medium uh, aspect of it. Okay, so I need to tell you a little bit of a story about uh, the Tada Rapids before the dam was built in order to understand the significance of it in relation to spirit medium. So the, the Tada Rapids was a major rapid that used to exist on the Seisan River, right where it ran, right, right above the confluence of where the Shreipok River ran into it. So just in the reservoir area of where the dam is now. And previously, it was believed that a spirit inhabited these rapids. And it had a Khmer name called Kahom Ka. It was also known as Dakhadeng, which is the Lao name for it. But it's believed to be a Khmer spirit, which I'll come back to later. And it was believed that this spirit inhabited these rapids. And these are quite dangerous rapids. So whenever boats went up and down the river, um, they would have to negotiate these rapids. And it was fairly dangerous. And um, one time after uh, uh, a boat... Uh, uh, almost tipped over and and caused the owner problems. The owner, uh, you know, at that time was praying that the spirit would not allow him to be drowned in an accident there. And after he survived, this was a Chinese trader who was trading up the river. He agreed to build a spirit house for this spirit that inhabits these rapids called, uh, uh, you know, Gaham uh, Ga. And so the 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 the, the spirit. Uh, uh, house was was built. And uh, basically, uh, in the 1990s and the 2000s, whenever a boat went up and down the river, and would pass this area, it would go up, it would park, the, the, the owner of the boat would park the boat, uh, the, the owner of the boat would go up to the spirit house, would offer a candle or a little uh, a prayer, and then would come back to the boat and continue on. And almost everyone did that. And I and, I personally did this a few times when I was traveling along the river before the dam was built. And so this was common practice in this area. And, and the spirit was believed to both to potentially be very dangerous, if not appeased. And uh, it was inhabiting these rapids. Okay. So, um, you know, after uh, the, the, the spirit house was built, it, the, the, the spirit medium that was believed to be um uh actually um channeling uh the gaham ka was living in a, a village just below where the dam is now called Pluk, which is an ethnic lao village um and it's it's just about 5 or 6 kilometers down river from the dam location and so uh this was uh you know the place where the spirit and the spirit medium would be called up to the spirit house periodically for some of the special uh, annual uh, rituals that were done with the spirit medium, which uh, I'll, I'll come to again in, in, in a few minutes. Now, this is the spirit house, and you can see uh, a large number of villagers here. Now, this is actually a photograph that was taken in 2012 when villagers went to protest the dam. And you can see here that uh, on the right side, is the Seisan River. And on the left side, you can't see it very well, but on the left side is the Shreipok River. This is right where the two rivers come together. And so the Spirit uh, spirit House is located, you know, just above this confluence. And this is where all the, uh, the villagers gathered when they wanted to protest against the dam in 2012. Um, this, mind you, is all underwater now that the dam has been built. So here are the villagers in 2012 coming down from the various villages um, with uh, to protest against the dam before it was constructed. And there had some uh, posters or some uh, banners that they prepared. And some of them came by small tractors from their villages. These are mainly ethnic Lao people. Um, here they are coming down. And then finally arriving uh, at the site of the lower uh, at the spirit house. And then uh, there were some speeches told, uh, you know, some uh, in which they were opposing the project. 
It didn't take much to convince villagers. These villagers are farmers and fishermen who are very reliant on the river and whose livelihoods were very threatened by it. And so it, they were very quick to, uh, to object to this project. Now, this is them doing a little ritual for the, for the spirits. And then the spirit medium arrives. So there she's preparing. She's the one standing up there, preparing her red cloth to put it around her body, which she'll do when she becomes possessed. Then she's uh, doing, she's now in her robe and has become possessed now at this point. And then the villagers are talking to her. And then she has a, a very old sword that's been passed down over generations, which she takes out and does some dancing with the sword. In fact, before this, uh, she would have been fed uh, some uh, moonshine whiskey made by the villagers. And it's believed that the spirit mediums cannot become drunk. But of course, they're, they drink right out of the bottle. Uh, and so uh, you can imagine that they might be a bit drunk by the time they get to this point. But anyway, uh, this, this, this spirit medium is, is the center of the protest in the sense that she's the one who's channeling the views of the spirit, but also the views of local people who are opposed to this project, of which she's one. So this is her doing her little uh, dance. Okay. So after the protest concluded, um, there's a lot of things happened over the years after that. I won't go into all the details because there isn't time to do that today. Uh, but the point, but eventually the dam was completed uh, in 2018. And uh, the Tada Rapids and the Sacred Taha and the rapids where the Koham Ka used to live uh, became flooded by the reservoir and went totally underwater. They're all gone now. So one of the questions that we had was, you know, uh, how is the local spirit medium respond to this? And especially the, because she's the one that led the original protests in 2012. And um, how can she reconcile her own inability to not be able to stop uh, the, uh, the dam from being constructed, despite all the opposition that was uh, up against it? So I'll go into some of that now. So this is the same woman that uh, I showed you in the 2012 photos. This is 10 years late, you mind you. This is just uh, from last June. In, and so she still is the spirit medium uh, uh, in, in, in the village, in, in Pluk village. And so this is a, a photo of, of her in, in, in her village and she's still playing that role. And uh, I interviewed her about this uh, situation. And um, it was... Uh, I learned that there was actually, it was more complicated than what we had originally thought in the sense that um, uh, this spirit medium, Niwanj, actually uh, channels a number of spirits, 14 spirits to be exact, um, of one of the most important being Kaham Ka, but not the only spirit that she channels. So she channels a number of spirits and uh, she and other villagers believe that the Kaham Ka, the, the Kaham Ka spirit is no longer in the Tada Rapids, which are now underwater. So they're, they're under the belief that the spirit has left the area. And um, they believe that uh, uh, the spirits, like Kaham Ka, go where they are fed. So the villagers believe uh, that uh, the spirit may have been enticed to go elsewhere uh, because uh, of the changing circumstances related to the dam construction. So um, she told us initially in 2021, when my uh, when Ekalat Sukapon visited the village, that the Kaham Ka would not go to the dam site and neither would any other Lao spirits. So initially, that was what they were saying. So there was a, a sense of resistance that the, 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 the sacred space of the spirit had been flooded, but the, the dam would not, but the, uh, the, the, the spirit would not go there. But then uh, when we were talking to two other villages who are very close to her, and they're uh, seen here, this is Mr. Mai and his wife, who are also from the same village. Um, Mr. Mai explained that, you know, that there were 14 spirits that uh, 
that Niwan was 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 channeling. And then he said all of a sudden, uh, Da Belair, which is grandfather Belair, he used to live on Suan Island, which is also in the Seisan River, but it was flooded when the when the dam, the Lower Seisan II dam, was built. We don't know where the bat where the Batale went or whether he is angry with us or not, commented Mai with a serious look in his face. So I soon came to understand when I met with them that um, they were concerned about the change in the river environment and how it was believed to be affecting the spirits that the spirit medium was channeling. And they were concerned that these spirits could become angry and that they could cause uh, you know, problems to themselves or other members of the community. And then uh, Mr. Mai went on. He said, then there is Dapa Kuang, who lives downstream from the dam and still stays in the, in the same old deep water pool and rapid areas where he, where he used to live. Um, and, and he was basically pointing out that um, he wasn't sure if, if Dapa Kuang was angry with any of the downstream impacts of the dam. Um, and he didn't believe that the spirit had been displaced because the downstream had not been changed as much as the reservoir area. But he wasn't sure. So there was a lot of um, apprehension and concern about what the potential impacts might be to the community members. A lot of anxiety and uh, uh, about, about what was going on. Um, and then Mai continued. He said, but we have we have heard that that Gaham Ga is angry. Um, and he he was really uh, you know visibly upset about this. And he said he made the first deputy headman John sick. John, John had to had to make an offering to the spirit about 200 meters below the dam in a forested area, Mai continued. Um, and Mai was uh, stating this all as fact, not as something that might or might not happen. To him, this was as real as anything else that might occur in that village was. It was it was it was not uh, there were some things that he would admit he doesn't know, but he did know that this spirit was upset and he did know that the deputy village chief did to need to needed to appease him to protect the community. Um, and then he said that uh, that he that it was very important that they make a new spirit meeting, a spirit house since the old one had been flooded uh, for Gaham Ga and that this was necessary to prevent any future impacts on the community. But that uh, this had not been, you know, completed yet. There, there, there had been an offering given, but the, uh, uh, an actual spirit, new spirit house had not been built yet. And then he concluded, he said, Gaham Gar hurt Jan because, because he did not arrange for a new spirit house for him quickly enough. So there was a sense that there was some urgency, there was a need to, to reconcile this issue. It had not been done. And, and Mr. Jan had become sick as a result. And it could potentially cause other people to get sick as well. So, um, when we, when I inquired more about about the nature of what people thought about Gaham Ga, they were saying, "Well, Gaham Ga, uh, they thought had actually gone, despite what we had heard earlier. They 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 revised their assessment and they said that they thought that the Gaham Ga had actually gone to the Chinese dam site." That it was staying in the Chinese dam site because the Chinese who work for the for the for the dam have an altar, and that they've been offering roasted pig almost every week, which is uh, uh, a luxury that local Lao people villagers you know rarely are able to offer to the spirit. I mean, they rarely eat pig; they they're mainly fish eaters. And this is an interesting comment from their part. It's not that they've actually seen this, but. Firstly, they believe that the Chinese eat more pork than they do. They believe that Chinese are pork eaters, that they're fish eaters, and that therefore, of course, the, the Chinese would be eating pork every week and that they would be offering pork to the to the spirit. They thought that the the, the, the pork would be would be fatty and therefore the spirit would like that. And therefore the, the spirit might have fled from its former location to stay with the Chinese because it had a lot to offer. And that the, the spirit medium, you know, didn't you would go wherever there was more food. And uh, and in this case, they couldn't compete with the the Chinese because they weren't sacrificing or eating pigs every every week. Um, interestingly, they also brought up that Gaham Ka, they believed, even though the spirit medium is Lao, they believe that Gaham Ka, the spirit is, is Khmer. But interestingly, there's another Lao spirit that... Uh, 
the same spirit medium channels, who's the wife of Kaham Ka, and her spirit is she's a she's Lao. So it seems to be a Khmer Lao marriage of spirits channeled through a Lao spirit medium. And this, uh, I won't get into this too much, but there's a, some complex ethnic issues going on here because this is an area that's historically been, you know, uh, populated by Lao people, but there have been some Khmer immigrants over time, sometimes powerful government officials that have been sent up from other parts of Cambodia. Often they do marry with local Lao women and it seems that what they're talking about with the spirit mediums is a is is following that pattern. So it is imagined, you know, that these Chinese people are eating a lot of pig, that they're sacrificing a lot of pork to the spirit medium. Therefore, the spirit, the the, the, the spirit, the spirit, not the spirit medium, and that um, this is like a fundamental part of their culinary tradition, and that this is that they can't compete with this, and therefore the spirit had gone to stay with the altar of the of the Chinese. And this really attests to important cultural place and mobility uh, aspects uh, when it comes to environmental struggles involving spirit mediums. So villagers have their own explanation of how spirit mediums are reacting to this, or how they're moving around and how they're responding. And, and it's part of the, the story of dams being built in their minds, even though these stories are almost are rarely told because they're really a kind of inside story of communities rather than a story that will end up, you know, on the front of a newspaper or, uh, or elsewhere. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, apart from Koham Ka, there's also another spirit, Dapa um, who is also a Khmer language speaker, but not Dapa Kuang, who's a Lao speaker. So geez, they have some, some mixtures, right? And their wives, Nang Jenlin and Nang Tale Tong are both identified as Lao speakers. So there's this sort of ethnic myth you have. Uh, and, and it's interesting because the Lao, the Lao people, they speak Lao in the village, but they can also speak some Khmer. So essentially, these are like uh, bilingual spirit mediums who, who, who tend to channel in both Lao language and Khmer language, depending on uh, what they're trying to do. And this is, you know, reflecting this sort of complex ethnic and linguistic circumstances in northeastern Cambodia, and the the nature of the particular communities that that are that we're talking about here, um, who mainly speak Lao but are living in Khmer territory in Cambodia now, and therefore, uh, the you know the the all the schools are in Khmer now, and so Khmer is becoming increasingly important as a language in the area. Um, and interestingly, he said Kaham Ka was also somewhat bilingual. Apparently, Kaham Ka could understand Lao, but only ever spoke Khmer, which means that the villagers can speak to Kaham Ka in Lao through the spirit medium, but Kaham Ka will respond in Khmer. And that reflects the idea that the, the uh, villagers often can speak Lao themselves, but they can't, they can understand Khmer, but they can't speak Khmer very well. And uh, the outsiders often show up and learn to understand Khmer, uh, understand Lao, but they can't really speak it very well. They tend to speak Khmer. So this is uh, uh, reflective of this of this situation. Okay, this is the this is the same uh, uh, as I showed you earlier the 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 the, the fish uh, uh, monument in uh, in Sukhren. But uh, okay, so basically um, what we see now is that the Lois Sen two has had huge material impacts, you know, on um, the local people, on the environment, on the river, right? Changing the relationships with their river, changing the relationships. And the, the relationship with the river is not just material, but it's the relationship to the spirits and the locations where the spirits have been living in their understanding that have also changed. And this is the part of the story that is rarely considered. You know, how is the, uh, the way in which they understand the sort of uh, uh, more than human kind of uh, entities that are also part of their life and part of their ways of thinking about uh, the world and, and, and how they live in it and their places in it. Um, and so uh, we can see that, um, you know, these spirits, they inhabit certain places. These are sacred places. They're important places also materially. 
because their uh, deep water pools are important for fish, rapids are places that are dangerous, but also important for fish. Um, these, and, and, and the spirit mediums have had a role in kind of managing these, uh, or, or helping to act as a medium between these spirits and people in the community so that the people in the community can appease them and maintain a kind of balance and maintain a kind of situation in which the nature and their 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 relationship with it and with the spirit mediums with the spirits themselves is 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 appropriate and so with the dam has come a huge change you know um uh and interestingly the spirit mediums were not resentful for the fact that Gaham Ga was unable to stop the the even though it's, they believe it's a very powerful spirit was unable to stop the building of the dam but they really blamed it on the fact that you know the Chinese had kind of given them the the, the roasted pig, which the, the which the spirit could not resist, and therefore you know had to, to succumb to that and was unable to stop the dam. Um, and so these uh, the temporalities of these impacts and the relationship that people have with the spirit mediums, which is continuing up to now, is still unfolding and in unusual and and you know i'm sure that next time i go back there'll be more to this story this is a you know they still haven't built the permanent uh replacement um spirit house there's still concerns about other spirits that might be unhappy and causing problems and so there's still a lot of things happening and this i think this is a type of thing that environmental impact assessments or you know um you know, ideas about how to deal with dam impacts rarely consider is how the people themselves understand the river and the entities that are associated with it. So, um, crucially, Kaham Ka himself is believed to be very mobile. He can even sometimes travel as far as Phnom Penh. He can move all around in the eye, in the understanding of the villages. And he is willing to go where he will be fed. And that is why he ended up at the... Uh, what they believe to be at the at the altar of the of the Chinese, and you know different spirit mediums and spirits, you know like Kaham Ka, maintain these similar roles, and they have a certain degree of potency uh, before the GAMS construction operation. But the future of spirit mediums and their practice remain uncertain, considering the changes that are occurring to the river, but also to the spirits that are associated with the river and how that might affect their belief and understanding regarding these spirits and their potency in the future moving forward is still something that remains uncertain, but it's certainly uh, a big part of what people are thinking about in these communities. And, um, but interestingly, the villages, at least up to now, are telling me that, that even though the, the spirit was not able to stop the dam construction as they hoped, um, they have not it's not eroded their faith in the spirit mediums and the role that the spirit mediums play. But who knows whether that'll be the case for all people and what will be what will happen as time goes on. Um, and the spirit medium, the main spirit medium in Pluk Village, you know, has you know formulated a narrative to explain this failure and thus retain the reputation for being potent within the community. But again. How this will will this narrative be sufficient to keep people believing in the spirit medium in the same way, and how will that relationship change over time? We see some changes happening already, but how that will ha happen is still a little bit up in the air. This is something that's likely to play out over a long period of time. So I'm happy to uh, take questions. Um, I'll, I think that's uh, about it then for me, and I will uh, hopefully we can have some good discussion moving forward. Thank you.